Well, welcome back to this important discussion on sustainability within the financial system. Our discussion this uh, morning will try and shed light on this critical theme of climate risk management in the financial sector and its relevance, particularly in our region that is vulnerable to climate change. As we know, extreme weather events disrupt economic activity, leading to financial losses and increased macroeconomic risks. As the frequency and severity of climate-related risk increase, a very important consideration for monetary authorities and regulators is to reflect on the scope of responsibilities they wish to carry in managing climate-related risks and climate financing. Now, to help me unpack this very important topic, I will start introducing my panel members on my far left, is Mr. Benedict Libanda. He's the CEO of the Environmental Investment Fund of Namibia and an expert in climate and environmental financing. Good morning and welcome. Next to Mr. Libanda, let's just test your mic out, shall we? Good morning. Fair. Good morning. Good Excellent. Morning. Thank you so much. Next to Mr. Libanda, we have the governor of the Bank of Mozambique, Rogério Sandamela. A very good morning to you, governor. Yes, good morning. Our host, Governor Kavacha. Good morning. Ms. Modera, we just heard of, from her a moment ago. Good morning again. And finally, the CCBG chairperson. Good morning. Yes, CCBG chairperson, Governor, let's start with you. Obviously, this week's um, attention was in Kenya and unlocking some of those responses and some of those answers to something that all of us are confronting. Governor, do you think that this particular issue has been prioritized in the manner that it should, and especially by central banks? Um, it is a priority. And um, I think as Sabine had said uh, earlier, we have got one planet. So if we have got disagreements on how we're going to deal with climate change, None of us can walk away from the deal. You are still stuck with the same planet, and uh, that is what uh, that is what we face. Uh, but also, the role that central banks uh, play uh, becomes important and uh, crucial. Uh, but I've always been very careful about mandate creep into central banks, where central banks end up being called upon to do things that they are actually not designed to do. So the approach that we took in South Africa was to clearly define our role in dealing with climate change within the mandate of a central bank. And so this necessitated us asking ourselves three questions. First was, how the economic and financial effects of climate change affect monetary policy? Secondly, how do we analyze the economic and financial risks arising from climate change? And thirdly, how do we minimize financial sector risk and facilitate the flow of funds to better encourage green investment? So in answering these three questions, we were we are developing new models, stress tests, data sources, and initiating analytical work to inform our policy decisions. We are also developing partnerships with institutions in South Africa and abroad to provide specialized skills and, uh, and training. And networks are very important in tracking, tackling capacity constraints and addressing knowledge gaps. It's for this reason that the work of the NGFS uh, is uh, very uh, important. And of course, non-financial and uh, financial firms need to disclose climate-related information so that climate-related risks can be mitigated and the resilience of the financial system can be, can be improved. But to do so, uh, uh, we need a taxonomy so that they can classify their activities correctly. We are providing guidance to the financial sector on how to do that within the Basel framework 
and following recommendations from the Financial Stability Board. So, these efforts, along with others, will improve the functioning of financial markets and support the flow of green uh, investment. So, our climate change related work is strictly driven by our financial and price stability mandates. We are concerned when we see calls for central banks to do more. We do not have the policy tools to do more. This sit with government. Doing more is often a clear mission clip uh, which can undermine central bank credibility and independence without any significant positive impact on the green transition. So central banks have a role to play in uh, combating climate change, but we must do that within our mandate given the tools that we have. All right. Thank you so much, Governor. Uh, probably the message is we need to stay in our lane. Uh, Governor uh, from Mozambique, uh, when you are hearing that role that central banks can play, obviously your country has been ravaged by a number of extreme weather situations. Yes. Uh, how have you intervened? Well, before I address that question, I want to say that's my first time I'm in Namibia. Thank you, Governor and everybody for inviting us, and particularly to be in Namibia. So I'm excited, beautiful country I hate so much. So congratulations for such a beautiful organization. It takes a lot. So we're, you know, we're pleased for the warm welcome that we have received so far. So thank you. Of course, Mozambique has been in the media all over the world. Uh, we have not been very lucky, we have been hit hard by the consequences of climate change. More, perhaps more than most countries in the region. We are not fortunate, there's one main issue there, it's our location, geographical location. We have a long coast of uh, 2,000 miles long, of which most of it is below sea level. That's very important. So that doesn't help. So every year we have cyclones. Just to have a sense, in the last three years we had more than 11 cyclones. Some more severe than others. In addition to floods, come together with the cyclones. We have what they call the our intertropical conversion zone. That doesn't help. Then we are in the downstreams of all the sheer watersheds. Everything's combined there. So it doesn't help. So when we look at the, the most severe one in our recent history, we have died, that has been referred to, but we have prepared to, which was last year. Just one of the cyclones, the heaviest one, sometimes we like to call the monster cyclone, that almost wiped out our second largest city, it was below underwater. We lost, in terms of output losses and infrastructure losses, amounting easily to about $1.5 million. That's what has been estimated, equivalent to about nearly 10% of our GDP. That's a lot for a country that is scrambling for resource not just fisc, with many challenges, structural, infrastructural change, many gaps, and having to rely on an external world that is more reluctant <coughs> to make resources available for development aid. So you go to places, there are a lot of places, when then things come real to disperse real money. The money that makes a difference in the lives of those who have been hard hit, then you realize what has been promised. If you are lucky, you'll get 50% of what has been pledged. So that's a challenge where you don't have the domestic savings to deal with it, which is our problem. But then when you go and appeal to the world, an immediate support is there, we come, make sure the rest lies. But then we have to deal with the immediate consequence, the afterward, the aftermath consequence, with rebuilding infrastructure, repairing what has been damaged. 
then we are facing problems. And some of the consequences are there are still present there. A lot has been done. So that's what I wanted to say at the beginning. We lost in terms of telecommunications, buildings, just in Beira, just to have a sense of it. Almost for a week, we had no clue what was going on. Beira was cut off. The second largest city in the country was cut off the rest of the country for nearly one week. Communications went down, the road were cut off, so nobody could reach them. Our own branch and Beira, we had no clue whether people were alive, what was going on. We had no information. We rely sometimes on satellite information from overseas. That's bad. So that's bad. So we learned the importance that we could not even try to rely on our communication towers. So now all our branch and most of us, we have satellite phones. Because we know when things get bad, the traditional infrastructure that allows you to communicate is not going to be present. So that's what is going on. We have done a number of things in the Central Bank also to deal with. In line with my dear friend, Governor Leticia, they said, we have to be careful that in the moments of emotions, we are not carried out, taken out, to do things that clearly are outside of our mandate. So we are the tremendous amount of pressure. The government has limited resources. And you can imagine the pressure that is there to find creative ways, innovative ways, to find resources, to deal with emergencies. And we have to resist that because some of these requests are not necessarily within our mandate, within our laws. Because again, you are sitting on money, you are sitting on reserves. Why you cannot make this money available now? even if the law doesn't allow you to do that. <laughs> and that's the question. And it takes a lot. You have a tremendous amount of pressure. So, well, you need to find some way. <laughs> but what does it mean? So that's not easy. So that's why it's important that in moments like that, we stress our mandate that at the end of the day, it's a government mandate to deal with these types of issue. Our role is complementary. Whatever we can do in that sense, in terms of policies, in terms of making resources available, we don't have much to say on that. But we can help in terms of making the right policy, to making sure, for example, I'll give you an example in Beira. We, we make sure that bank, banks also suffer and they, you know, some of them, they had no clue what happened. They lost their branches in the city of Bay. And one thing I remember very well, just as it was announced that there had been a monster cyclone, all the branches in Bay did one thing. <coughs> they brought all their money, all their valuables to the central banks. We were just lucky that the only financial institution, our branch in Beira, that didn't go underwater. So we were able to protect the valuables, not just of the central bank in terms of, but also of the commercial banks that were lacking in the country. So the important things of resilience, being prepared for the worst, it can never be stressed enough. Maybe I'll stop here <coughs> and I will then say a little bit more on other details for the time being. I don't know what ever trust it. But it basically in line with what government has say. We really, in moments like this, we have to have the audacity of say yes. We know, we understand, we are there, but we don't have the mandate. The legislature did not give us the tool to deal with this type of shocks. So that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Governor, for providing that color um, of some of those extreme events that we have been watching on, on television and reading about. And obviously, the unconventional ways uh, that you have also tried to intervene uh, in terms of that operational risk, the institutional 
uh, capacity to also deal with uh, some of those events as well. Governor Kabahab, maybe let me come to you. The Prime Minister this week is announcing to us that 600,000 Namibians are vulnerable. Um, they may require drought uh, relief and drought assistance. What is the picture in Namibia as far as climate change is concerned and also the role of the central bank? Thank you very much for the opportunity to respond to this crucial question. You started off by referring to the climate summit in, in Kenya this week. There was a very interesting report by the UN in 2022. And according to this report, Africa is losing between 7 to 15 million US dollars annually due to climate risk. To mitigate this risk, we need to raise annually about 128 million US dollars, but we are only able to raise about 24 to 28 million US dollars. So we are very far from raising the necessary financing to mitigate this risk. We need to do more because listening to the governor of Mozambique, it's real. And it's easy during the peace times to talk about mission creep in our mandate, which we should do, be doing. But when the rubber hits the road, it's a totally different ball game. Then we need to find the modus vivendi between what we find on the ground and what we can do in terms of accepting. But under peaceful conditions, we need to craft the necessary policies that can help us carry that. Let's get back to Namibia and understand what's happening in our country. Namibia is one of the driest countries in sub-Saharan Africa, characterized by very high climatic swings. You know, we have got the one of the oldest deserts, the Namib Desert, on our western side, and then our eastern side we have got the Kalahari Desert. And that causes quite a lot of dryness. So the dryness that we get in Namibia, why is it so dry in our country? Is caused by the Banguela current that flows in a northerly direction and it brings cold air driven by a high pressure system. So this combination of the cold air and the high pressure system that suppresses rainfall. That's why we have got constant droughts in our country. And the most recent times we had droughts in Namibia in 2013, we had in 2016, 2019 drought was quite devastating. 2022, we have heard from our Prime Minister, it caused high levels of food insecurity, it caused water problems in our country. And in 2023, if we listen to all the baseline forecasts, another El Nino is looming. So the Prime Minister said the government is going to intervene until June next year to try and assist. That is how real climate change is. So it affects productivity, it affects water, it affects food security in the country. That's how it affects the nation. So how should we think about this as a central bank? In as much as I agree with the mandate of central bank, being price stability, financial stability. The way we think about this is what Sabina mentioned to, uh, alluded to, is we have got the ability to analyze. The research capability of most central banks is quite good. So we need to use that capacity to analyze and monitor, to understand what are the credit risks caused by all these. What's the inflation risk that's being brought by all these? And based on that, we need to decide how do we craft our monetary policy. That's the first one. The second one is on financial stability. You know, as central bankers, we supervise most of the commercial banks. So we need to understand how these risks translating into risk at our central power, the commercial banks. And our commercial banks must really in the investment and lending decisions start thinking very, very seriously in terms of stress testing. What's happening? Our non-banking financial sector 
the insurance particularly, because insurance manages and distributes risk. So the nexus between commercial banks and the insurance is something we need to understand. That's the way we think about uh, this Bank of Namibia in terms of the risk that climate is introducing into the economy. Maybe as we wrap up the conversation around the mandate of the central bank, maybe, Sabina, if we can draw your, uh, maybe if you can cycle back to your earlier conversation around um, what central banks can do. Obviously, some of the things that you are hearing is perfectly in line with uh, what you were saying earlier. But what more can be done? Maybe I think it's so crucial what was said because it shows that we are really struggling about you know our role as central banks in this regard. Because what, what as of course, one threat is that uh, policies lie ba lay back and say, well, central banks do the job. This is not, you know, that's not the way it should be. So therefore it is, oh, sorry. <laughs> therefore it is really crucial for us to define our responsibility within our mandate. And I couldn't say better than, than you've done, but I think our crucial task is to use our analytical capacity and draw the attention of our governments that it is crucial to act now. Because this is, I mean, we cannot set up the climate policies, but it is our task and our duty to allow the, the governments to act uh, accordingly. I think this is very important that we, that needs to be done. The second point is, of course, within our mandate, and we heard that, and maybe just to refer to the governor of Mozambique, it is crucial to learn from you this experience, because if I hear that governance asked to, to use research and others, right, it shows how important in this regard our independencies is, and that we need to make clear financial stability, price stability, is the baseline for our econo economic stability, even in crises like that. And therefore, I mean, the world needs to know, or governance globally needs to know what you experience, because this may, might be experienced by others as well. So it's crucial to share what we already experience. You asked me what else uh, central banks uh, needs to do. Of course, we also have to do the risk mitigation. We, uh, many of us have the uh, responsibilities to um, supervise the financial institutions and we have to do the stress testing like um, South Africa and many others I, I did. Um, in the beginning, I, it was about only de-risking the financial system from climate rise. Having done the work at the NGFS now a few years, I, I have experienced that this is not enough. Because there's, it's not just the road to, to take the risk out of the financial system. The risk does not shy away. What we, I think and this is because of our experience, also our role. We have to define the role of the financial system. And as we learned um, pledges also from multi-development banks from other uh, countries are huge, especially immediately after an event. But in reality, when it comes to finance project, structural changes, and so on, we need to need much more, not only private money, but also real money that, that is in the project, stays there, and is sufficient. And therefore, I think we have to think of what would trigger also private money and the financial system as a whole to finance adaptation and transformation. Maybe we'll, let's wrap up on this issue. I am Selebanda. We will bring you in on climate financing in, in particular. I know you are ready to go on, on, on that one in particular. But Governor Kanyapo, uh, on the issue of the mandate, and, and obviously you have very, we understand central banks to be very powerful. You have moral suasion in your toolkit. Um, and all of those, all, all of those powers. Do you think that those powers are being brought to bed to address this challenge? You know, um, I listened to the Honorable Prime Minister and how she had framed the interaction 
between policies and interests. It's actually very important that we be clear as to who is playing uh, what role. I worry central banks have been very successful. And um, we've been successful in bringing price stability. And uh, for a very long time, we even became complacent because price stability was now granted, it was given. That's when how the global financial crisis set in uh, because we were here, we lost sight of what else is going uh, on around us. At least with climate change, we are not uh, um, uh, caught napping. Uh, we have seen it, it's reality, it affects how we think about setting out our monetary policies, how we set out our financial policies and how we supervise the sectors and so forth. Yes, uh, uh, central banks are, uh, are powerful. Uh, they have tools. I'm not sure that the tools are that powerful. They are designed for a purpose. I wonder that society has got an inflated expectation of what central banks can do. Central banks can do what society tasks them with, and that is what we actually uh, ought to do. Are we uh, bringing to bear our uh, ability? I think we are. And, um, you know, I have got this series in my, uh, in my uh, research uh, team. The series is called the Reserve Bank Working Paper Series. So we would analyze and we would release a working paper. The paper is very clear upfront. These are not the views of the Reserve Bank. These are the views of the authors, and it's not just the staff who do this. We bring other people from outside that could co-author with the staff. The headline last week was, South African Reserve Bank has got a solution to our fuel price problems. <laughs> no. <laughs> do, you, do you get you, you get the danger? And that comes a day before a massive fuel price increase was announced in South Africa. <laughs> so the question was, well, this, this institution, they have got a solution. Why don't we get it? Once all that we did was to analyze problems in the current pricing formula and that there are reforms that could have uh, to be uh, done. But again, we said we are just providing the power that you talked about. We were deploying our analytical power to say, here is the stuff. And so, so those things become very important, uh, very important to balance. In South Africa, we decided that we were going to manage this thing uh, uh, differently. Our constitution tasks us to have regular consultations with the Minister of Finance. So we, 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 we set up structures where both institutions share their analytical work on a range of, uh, uh, of issues. And, and when we get to the issue of climate financing, uh, I will share some of those, uh, of those views. But let me just say that some of the things that central banks are being asked to do are things that central banks did in the past, didn't succeed in doing those, and society says, no, you guys are actually a problem. So what, is, what happens? When central banks get bored because they have been so successful in what they have been, they start to, to play. So they start to find things. They start to uh, try and play in the inequality stuff. They try and play in poverty. And then they try and uh, play in climate. And then they try and play. And then before you know it, we are doing all of these things. And everybody in society will ask us, and, uh, what about this and what, uh, what about that? And that um, uh, becomes important that society understands We've designed this institution, this is the role it must play. And if we have to deal with the climate, do we need, this? what is the role of environmental ministers uh, if we are talking about this and that and that? And I think that the Nigerian uh, approach where the Prime Minister, from what I had heard, got tasked with this responsibility and she had to pronounce this. She has got the power to command the other ministers to come to the party. 
the central bank? No, we do not have that. The prime minister might command the central bank to say, I need your analytical capability. Bring it on board so that we can use it in dealing with these problems. And I think that is where we should be coming in. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mr. Libanda, let's bring you in. The costs of adaptation and mitigation is huge. The International Energy Agency is estimating that mitigation-related investment needs in emerging and developing uh, economies will reach two trillion US dollars by 2030. The World Bank is telling us that South Africa uh, is estimated to need, uh, or climate financing needs uh, equals 4.4% of the GDP per year between 2022 and 2050. So the scale, the scale of cost is outstanding. Where is that money coming from, sir? Thank you. Thank you for the question. But before I answer my question, um, I'm extremely excited to be here. It's the first time that I'm speaking to very important people. <laughs> 16 governors of Central Bend, the governor of the great, you know, Irongo region, uh, esteemed panelists and Lastly, the right honourable Prime Minister, so I'm so humbled to be here. So thank you so much. Um, I think uh, to appreciate our actions, or the global actions against climate change, one has to understand the rationale behind that. And that is extremely important. One is that the atmosphere scaling capacity has been exceeded in terms of holding greenhouse gases. So the current uh, emission in the atmosphere is 416 parts per million. The carry capacity at pre-industrial revolution, that is in 1870, was uh, 250 parts per million. So now we've exceeded it to 416 parts per million. What does that mean? It means more extreme weather patterns. Parts per million is the number of molecules concentrated in the atmosphere, and that results in dry air. And that dry air has got an effect on climate change at extremes. So that's number one. Number two, the consumption patterns of developed countries are extremely unsustainable, especially the USA. The way the USA is consuming natural resources, we we'll need about four to five Earth planets to be sustained. Then number three is the population growth. Uh, it's all, we continue to grow, we're pressing more pressure on natural resources. All these calamities have led to an increase of 1.1 degrees Celsius since 1870. To, 9, to 2020, 2015, and for the world to reduce uh, uh, the, the global warming, we need to hold it below 1.5 degrees global average warming. But what is most scary is that the, the, Sadiq, the Southern African country is the most vulnerable in the world. So at, 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 an, at a global average of 1.5 degrees, it means sadly is at 2 degrees Celsius, even more alarming. So there's a need to really respond to the impacts of climate change and the global warming at, at large. Getting back to what sectors are responding, especially the financial sector from the sustainability point of view. Last year, the global um, sustainable green issuance stood at 1.5 trillion US dollars, that is green bonds, uh, social bonds, and so forth. And that was a reduction from 1.7 trillion US dollars in 2021. And this was influenced by um, the additional ESG requirements the, uh, the unfavorable, unfavorable macroeconomic conditions, but most importantly, greenwashing in the United States. Uh, in that, uh, we saw a lot of pushback from 
major institutional investors in the United States because ESG has been placed at the level of uh, investment returns. But this was saved by regulations in the EU. Uh, these regulations through the EU um, Green Taxonomy, which is one, the, 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 the European Emission Trading Scheme, as well as the, uh, the EU uh, Carbon Border Adjustment uh, Mechanism. And it's time for central banks, especially in our region, to take a closer look at these two pieces of regulation because they, 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 they place a price on carbon, especially for hard to abate industries such as steel, uh, cement, as well as uh, petrochemicals. Why am I saying so? Uh, because of the carbon taxes that is imposed yeah, between trading partners. Yeah. So there's a, an impact on the balance uh, uh, on the balance of trade. Uh, if a commodity does not account for carbon emission when it enters and traded in Europe, it will be heavily taxed on carbon carbon tax. So those are kind of uh, uh, situations where we find ourselves as, 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 as developing countries, as also as 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 as, as, as uh, uh, SADC. So it comes to the to the to the global action requirements in terms of you know uh, decarbonization. We, we need we need about 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 two two trillion US dollars you know, annual investment into both mitigation and adaptation. SADIC needs about an average of 200 billion US dollars every year, up to 20, 2035, to adequately uh, address the, uh, what you call the national determined contribution of each country, of all the 16 member states. These are the promise to the world, to the Paris Agreement, on how uh, the, the, the SADIC countries will uh, address uh, climate change in terms of mitigation. In total, the region requires 635 billion US dollars by 2030 for us to adequately respond to climate change. There is no better players than the private sector to bring them on board because public, public resources are, are so limited. And that calls for innovative financing, called for calls for, 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 for strategic partnership between the North and the South, as well as uh, coming up with uh, new policies and legislation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Governor, you wanted to touch on the issue of uh, climate financing. Do you care to expound on some of the innovative approaches in, in South Africa? Well, when I get to that, and then I'm glad that uh, my fellow panelists have just uh, skilled uh, this stuff. I mean, the UN estimates that the entire continent will need $2.8 trillion by 2030. That is 93% of Africa's GDP. There is no fiscal space to do that. So, so the issue of them going to um, uh, the private sector and blended finance then becomes, uh, becomes, uh, becomes important. But let me, let me, let me, let me put it uh, uh, this way and say, in South Africa's experience of the just energy transition state had to be very important things to grapple with. And as we grapple with this thing, we must also understand the other aspect is very strongly fiscal. Fiscal is understressed not just in the South, in the North too. So donor funding is not going to be easily uh, flowing because those fiscal authorities are themselves uh, seriously, uh, seriously constrained. Uh, that said, let me say that the grand component of the blended financing uh, in this our just energy transition, the grand component is actually very small. And the debt component of the blended instruments is, 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 is quite large. Uh, give you an idea, up until recently, only 500 million dollars uh, were in the form of grants in the 6.5 billion dollar uh, just transition financing that South Africa uh, is facing. 
So that, that is not going to be uh, to be uh, a sustainable uh, element. Secondly, is that blended finance models actually require some capacity in the public sector. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to take advantage uh, advantage uh, uh, of that. And that, thirdly, the focus of blended finance blended models now is on mitigation funding and not on adaptation, which is more important for many African countries. We need more adaptation-related funding with effective ways to manage foreign currency and credit, uh, credit risk. And fourthly, blended instruments do not reduce the risk of projects or funding. They simply shift it from one balance sheet to another. So this poses challenges for financial sector regulators as we need to understand the risk structure of complex blended financial uh, instruments. So we're going to have to invest in the capacity of our own uh, supervisors to do this. Fortunately, the, some of the tools are available from the NDFS and the Financial Stability Board and the BIS have got this thing. But that means that supervisors are constantly uh, having to learn uh, uh, these things. And uh, I don't know, sometimes we constrain ourselves because we employ economists and so forth, uh, but, uh, but we do not understand uh, this. Uh, go and employ climatologists. What would be wrong with the Reserve Bank advertising saying that we are looking for climatologists? Bring them here and put them along supervisors so that they can ask the difficult questions as we go in. And that is going to be to be an important thing. But that's one last thing that uh, was raised about uh, taxation of uh, carbon at points of entry when uh, we export. And that's a very interesting tool, uh, because then that means that uh, we've got to consciously think about the carbon footprint of our exports. But then lies the problem. Let me take this one back. You see, we had COVID, and we all said that none of us is safe unless all of us are safe. And so we had this global shutdown. As soon as there was any inkling that the technology for vaccines is there, what happened? The North hoarded the technology, right? And. Um, we had to scream and fight for the vaccines and say, oh, our population first. We are seeing similar things with climate. The technology is emerging and there is protectionism on the technology. Instead of getting this technology shared with them, so instead the global north is putting barriers from, for our exports to get in with carbon taxes. At the same time, they are holding on to the technology that we need to green our economy. You can't have it both ways. Well, Dr. Sabine. Yeah. And representing the Global North, I'm a <laughs> <laughs> But today I'm here in the capacity of the NGFS incoming chair. <laughs> now, uh, I will come back to that one, but maybe before, because you address uh, two points, I think they are really crucial. First thing is capacity building. And um, we need, our people in our institutions to train. And the NGFS and other institutions are um, started to do trainings to have libraries available and so maybe also governance, dear governance, if you think about joining the NGFS, this is something we can offer, offer as well. Capacity building in our institutions and the supervisory boards and so on, it is crucial for our people to understand the impact of climate change on our uh, mandate. That's, that's good. The second point I really would like to, uh, what you alluded to, dear Governor, is uh, blended finance. So it is absolutely true. When I listen to the pledges, and, and now we soon the, the COP will be, and it's, we are focusing on public money. And I think this is the wrong direction because, and you address it very well, the global north has its own challenges. We do have geographical uh, or geopolitical shifts. We do have a demographic change and uh, we do have the climate change 
and a transition from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. These alone, those three topics, will need massive investment within the global north. So public spending in this jurisdiction is already not enough even for these domestic challenges. So now talking about the challenges of the global south, of course, still money will go to the global south, but not, un well, never has been unlimited, but maybe, well, let's face it, how much is left for foreign, uh, for foreign uh, um, responsibilities. So having said that, the, the private sector, the private money has to play a major role because most of the money, and we heard this, the volumes we, we need, and I think they're still underestimated. So we really have to deal with how can we encourage and, and integrate uh, the private sector. Final word, blind defendant finance. Um, I do, I, mean, I have a 12 year career on a um, MDB of KFW in Germany, and we offered already a blended finance, the European Investment Bank does it, the World Bank does it, and so on. And there are great models, and, and the NGF, as we also deal with, you know, how can blind, blended finance look like? And maybe for all of you who are not familiar with it, blended finance is the mixture of um, having, uh, first of all, public money, be it <coughs> Or debt or taking equity, and this is in order to trigger private money. And my experience and the experience um, of the a lot of MDBs is, is even if you take a lot of the risk for the project, still private investors shy away. Why do they shy away? Because the risk return profile so far is not sufficient. And I just to, uh, share with you what I have um, been experienced with talking to international great uh, or big investors, also institutional investors, is two things. The first thing is we shy away from greenwashing. We fear that this project is greenwashing. So they need to know whether this is investable. I need a label from an independent institution saying this is really a sustainable project. The second thing that investors need is, is um, to mitigate the risks, and that's what I addressed in my speech. I said, what is really important is that the structure, the, the, the legal structure, the financial stability, the price stability within the country of this project is stable enough mm -hmm. so that I can take this risk from a risk return profile. Thank you. Excellent. And as we wrap up the discussion, um, maybe let me hear last views on, on climate financing from the two uh, governors, but also the opportunity that is there. And, and, and I think Dr. Sabine referred to that there is an opportunity uh, in this just transition, in this transformation for our economies as well. Uh, Mr. Gabahat, maybe if I can hear your views on that. Yeah. Let me first say that the Bank of Namibia's board has approved that we apply for membership of the network for green financing so that we can help with capacity building, one, and secondly, so that we can get access to best practice. That's the first one. The second one is around, you know, COVID came and devastated quite a lot of gains we made, and we needed to borrow on the continent just to survive, to save life and livelihoods. That has increased debt levels in many of the African countries. And as we are really grappling with this, we had this inflation challenge that we got. So interest rate got increased across most of the countries and the global world, whether it's Africa, whether it's in the global world. So it's quite difficult to access foreign markets for capital because it's quite expensive now. So as far as I'm concerned, on the continent, the quicker we start realizing we are on our own, the better. If we can attract fine, but it's not easy under current conditions to get money cheap. It's very expensive because we all know where interest rates are. We talk about just transition and we talk about all the challenges. I always believe, and yes, we need to acknowledge all the challenges, but what's helpful is what President Rubio said, we need to find the solutions. And what, what is that that we are thinking? How do we think about these things in Namibia? If people about 
talk about just transition. Just transition came at the time where we have discovered oil and gas. Uh, we are a country where we have got unemployment, we've got inequality, we've got poverty. So we believe that we need to be allowed to exploit that resource to deal with the challenges that we have got in the country. So, so that's the way Namibia thinks around, around oil and gas. But we are also committed to make a contribution to decarbonization. And towards that end, we have got an aspiration to produce green hydrogen and derivatives. And at COP26, we came out and we basically announced a firm that's going to help us produce green hydrogen and derivatives. So we have got a project that's running now with Hyphen. We also have got a project running with Douglas. So that's our commitment or the testament of our commitment to make a contribution in that space. So I believe in terms of the solution that we need to get, so it could be a function in terms of financing of the public sector coming to the table, the private sector coming to the table, plus carbon pricing should be an integral part of, of that. That's probably the way we need to go and find the solution in terms of dealing with this. Thank you. Governor Sander Miller? Yes, uh, thank you again. Uh, I just wanted to comment a little bit on what I heard here from my colleagues and panelists. Somehow, I, I, I get a little bit concerned about the role of the private sector in this exercise. They need that tremendous. There is more and more reluctance from the global north to make resources available down to the south. For it's changing political constraints, governments are tight. And it's clear that in the north, they know that the government has to play a major role in driving this process in terms of making sure and mobilizing enough resource. Public funds are, will be the driving seats in the world. Then when we start say, well, okay, bye, then that's what it is. But then when it comes to us and say, well, you know, the needs are there, it's very expensive, we don't have the resource, you need to rely on the private sector. It's quite frankly, it's not realistic. It's theoretical, but when you try to implement that, we have so many challenges that we have trouble to get the private sector to involve on some of our critical needs in terms of funding. And we are trying to bring this private sector on some more issues where they clear they cannot even price properly that risk. How are we going to do it? I'm not sure, I'm probably skeptic about it. So in my view, if we are real going to be serious about that, especially in the global north, public money has to be part of the equation. At least at the beginning, to allow time for the private sector to get to know what type of risk is that is there, whether it's willing to bet, and at what price. Otherwise, we've just been very, very theoretical. Nothing's going to happen. There is a role for us to play, of course, in terms of mobilizing our domestic resource, which are small, but we need to do a little bit more. We are countries in deficit with huge amounts of debt. In some cases, our debts are unsustainable. So when we are calling to the government to be bringing additional resource to what we are saying, well, yes, it's a priority, but it's not an immediate priority. We are still dealing with the issue of making sure that people are fed in most of our countries. How do you bring those issues to people who don't have unable to meet most of our citizens are still unable to meet our basic needs. Let's be realistic about that. So, in my view, that's what I want to summarize on that. Really, I think we need to have a discussion where in the north, how serious you are, 
about this exercise to the South, how willing you want to show it, both with your money, <laughs> with your pocket, that yes, the South needs to be part of it, unless we bring resource, a significant amount of resource, very little is going to happen in the region, at least in the media future, in the next, in the media. I don't see it happen. We will keep talking and talking and talking and materially very little happening on the ground. That's one question. What can we do as a central bank? We do the basic things that have been said here. Capacity building. We need to be trained. We've been fortunate. We have a nice, good partnership with Norges Bank from Norway. They have a resident advisor. We are sitting at the central bank. They've been training us among many other things, including how to deal, how to bring climate change to our assessment of financial risks in terms of stress tests. It's not easy, it's not easy. So, but we are learning from that. In terms of financial instability, how to identify, how do you quantify, how do you work with our local banks, what do we expect our local banks to do, what types of regulatory reforms do we need to make to make it easier for banks to address, to internalize that risk. So we are there. We are still in the learning curve. But we have awareness. We are getting help. That's all I can say at this stage. We are not putting money because we don't have that amount of money. But we are getting trained so we can do more within our day. So thank you very much. Selibanda, in your passing remarks, or parting remarks rather, uh, are you optimistic about the financial sector's response? Just hearing from the governors this morning. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to build on what the governor of Namibia has said, uh, of the Namibia Central Bank has uh, touched on. Um, uh, and I want to share some uh, experiences and lessons of what we're doing on blended financing in Namibia. Uh, we have established what an entity called uh, uh, SDG Namibia One, which is a fund, and that's a blended financing uh, platform to invest towards green hydrogen assets and uh, derivatives. And uh, how we went about it is that in 2021, the government of Namibia and the Dutch Netherlands government entered into a bilateral agreement. Uh, with the objective of supporting the Namibian government to develop its, 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 its green hydrogen ambition. And one of the, uh, the, the support in that bilateral agreement is to, it was to establish an SDG Namibia 1, which is a blended financing uh, facility. Uh, and to address issues of capacity, capacities uh, to manage such, such complex facility, we partnered, when I say we, the Parameter Investment Fund, partnered with a, a Dutch-based uh, uh, expert entity, fund managers, which, go, which is called the Climate Fund Managers. And now we've incorporated this SDG number one, and uh, it is managed by uh, the Namibia Green Hydrogen Fund Managers. And the office, we just opened the office in Binduk uh, uh, about two weeks ago for, 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 for that fund managers. The idea is to mobilize at least 1 billion uh, euros by June 2025. Uh, with leverage as well as capital cycling, we see that you know adding up to about 3 billion euros in terms of investments over time. Uh, within the blended finance structure that we have, we do have three different funds. We do have a development fund, which is grant capital of, of 100 million USD, but we've secured 40 million so far, and we are busy fundraising for another 60 million USD. Then there is a construction equity fund, which has got three different stretches of, 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 of uh, different, you know, uh, risk return profiles, the senior date, junior date, etc. So each investor can participate where, uh, where, where, where it really confirms in terms of, of, of risk return. Then we've got the, the, the operational fund, 
where it's, it's more of a, a fixed income fund where institutional investors such as pension fund, commercial banks, bonds also participate. And that, 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 that is a really good arrangement in terms of transfer of skills, managing the fund, etc. And uh, just in closing, uh, uh, I think uh, climate change cuts across all sectors and everyone has, has, has got a role to play. Uh, uh, science tells us that we are entering the sixth wave of, of extinction, so we need to act fast and quickly. <laughs> it sounds, sounds scary, but that's the reality, that's what science tells us. Huh? I, um, I would really recommend to, to, to central banks, even to open small units, yeah, just to facilitate some of, 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 of the low hanging fruits that we are seeing. We are seeing a, a lot of debt for nature swaps, for example, taking taking shape around around the world, where you can you know swap your debt. And most, uh, traction on the continent in Africa has got the biggest uh, possibility and opportunity for carbon trading, and that again you know is good for forests for for for, for, for our uh, countries. Uh, those are just a few of 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 of, of low hanging. Uh, uh, opportunities that you can look at. Thank you so much. Gavan Khanyako? Okay, I, I have a lot to say that just to uh, give you the naivety of a central banker. I think there's a view that um, uh, the climate stuff for, for the north is also like foreign. And the thing about climate is that there is no foreign and domestic here. We have got one planet and that is what we are, uh, we are stuck with. That's what I wanted to say, but I think that it's important that uh, Sabine uh, didn't just fly here for nothing. He's here. She's here to get members. <laughs> <laughs> More members. <laughs> of course, I'm here because I love Namibia. And, but of course, um, my intention is, of course, you know, to raise the awareness, but to also um, ask you whether you could once again reflect to become a member of the NGFS, I would highly appreciate re at least reflecting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear panel members. I'm sure the riveting debate that we have had and the insightful discussion of today uh, will continue uh, as members of, of the network. The debates and discussions today have underscored the need for international cooperation and equitable partnerships between the Global North and Global South. As we navigate the global transition to a greener, more sustainable financial system, it is imperative that no one is left behind. In closing, I encourage all of us to carry forward the insights gained today, to continue these vital conversations, to take concrete actions, to foster uh, resilience against climate-induced financial risks. Together, we can pave the way for a more economically sustainable and environmentally secure future. Thank you once again to my esteemed panel. A round of applause to them, please. This was the opening session of the 57th CCBG meeting. The meeting continues in a short while. Thank you so much for your attention, our viewers on our platforms, as well as the national broadcaster. We conclude now, but the, as I said, the official proceedings will continue in just a moment. But first things first, let me ask my governors for a photo opportunity with the media in the room.